I think one of the most important concepts that that helps to to understand what we have been doing is that my colleague Per Bokama from from Aarhus University recently uh, published uh, an hypothesis that uh, and provided also some evidence for that. Um, that Parkinson's is probably at least two different types of Parkinson's, uh, basically uh, separating patients into either uh, body first or brain first uh, patients. So, which basically means uh, describes the site of the initiation of the first uh, pathology. So, let's say alpha synuclein um, aggregation and neurodegeneration. So, the hypothesis being that in subjects that that are a brain first uh, phenotype that for one reason or another, this process starts uh, in the brain, uh, whereas in, in the body first patients, uh, probably the best guess is that it would start in the gut. And, and then subsequently, basically this pathology and alpha synuclein spreading in a prion-like fashion through the vagus nerve, for example, to the brain stem. It seems that idiopathic REM sleep behavior disorder, which is a very, uh, very specific early symptom, um, a prodromal symptom carrying a very high risk of developing Parkinson's disease later on, that this uh, idiopathic RBD may be one clinical marker for this body first phenotype, because basically it is originating from lower uh, brainstem uh, nuclei dysfunction. And then only afterwards, when the, pro when the pathology reaches the midbrain, then we get the motor symptoms of the disease. Whereas for the disease that starts in the brain, one would expect the spreading to first go to the midbrain, so we get first the motor symptoms <clears throat> without the sleep disturbance, and only later on, uh, you know, this pathology would also reach the lower brain stem, and and uh, so RBD can can also occur, but only after the motor symptoms um, have already appeared. So this concept of of separating Parkinson's into, into subtypes. I think it is very promising. So we don't know if these two subtypes are the only ones there are or if there are more, but I think it is a crucial um, change of, of the concept uh, because the old uh, concept, basically looking at Parkinson's only as one group of patients, I think has probably been one of the main reasons why all the trials that try to modify the disease to slow down the disease have basically failed. Because when you end up, I mean, you have a disease that has interactions between genetic and environmental factors, and eventually a certain combination of those can lead to the disease. So and these combinations can vary between different patients. Uh, so different genetic uh, vulnerabilities and different environmental factors. And when you have let's say the perfect storm, the perfect combination of these, then you may end up getting Parkinson's disease. And so for different patients, this perfect storm probably has different uh, components. And uh, I think this is a very crucial point to understand because I think that this will hopefully help us to really design um, <clears throat> more successful clinical trials when we understand um, that a certain subgroup of patients may be responsive to a certain treatment uh, but another group, maybe not. So meaning that when we lump all this together into one big clinical trial, then some patients may benefit and some not. But at the end, we may end up with a negative trial um, and a lot of money and resources uh, is lost. But when we have the chance of using these markers to build, let's say, smaller groups, but really precisely defined homogeneous groups, uh, then we have a better chance of, of finding successful treatments um, for this specific subgroup when we understand better what's the actual problem in, in this subgroup. And I think that is where this prodromal microbiome study also comes in, because what we were interested in is whether there is a group of so-called prodromal symptoms that has been identified or pro prodromal and risk markers for Parkinson's disease. So REM sleep behavior disorder is one, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, constipation, uh, exposure to pesticides and, and these kind of things. We all know that these are associated with an increased risk of getting Parkinson's disease. However, as I said, they are combined in different ways in different individuals. So it's still very difficult to predict uh, who will get Parkinson's, even though a person is exposed to one or two or three of these risk factors, it may still not be enough. So there may still be other factors necessary. And there, there are like risk scores that have been developed. So prodromal risk scores that basically allow you to calculate 
statistically, what's the risk of a person getting Parkinson's disease later on? So basically, you you, you check all these, let's say, 10 different uh, prodromal and risk factors, whether they are present or not, and then you can calculate, okay, this patient has a, let's say, 80 per, 80, 80 uh, percent risk of, of getting Parkinson's disease. However, it may also be that these risk factors are not uniformly distributed in prodromal patients. So meaning that uh, our hypothesis was that they may actually cluster together. So which fits to the concept of brain first and body first. So that is not like a random distribution of these risk factors in different subjects, but that certain factors may cluster uh, and determine together the risk for Parkinson's disease. And so that is why we looked at the microbiome as one additional factor in this context, because we have, um, it has been, there was one study that showed that in REMC behavior disorder, there is similar microbiome changes than um, in established Parkinson's disease previously. However, we had the chance with the, with the great uh, help from Daniela Berg and Sebastian Heinzel from, from Kiel, and, and from the Tübingen Trend team to, to look at a large cohort of over 600 uh, elderly, healthy individuals. And so they didn't have any diagnosis of um, any neurodegenerative disease. However, they have a very broadly um, and detailed, uh, detailed assessments of different risk factors and potential prodromal symptoms. Uh, and they are followed up every two years. And so what we found was that there are certain prodromal and risk factors that have a clear connection to the gut microbiome. Uh, for example, constipation, uh, REM sleep behavior disorder, um, physical activity or inactivity. And those are clearly linked to the gut microbiome. Whereas other factors such as, for example, hyposmia, so loss of smell or um, uh, hyperechogenicity of the, of the Sustentia nigra uh, assessed through ultrasound, they didn't show any connection to the microbiome. And so what we think is that um, this tells us that indeed there may be different subgroups of prodromal subjects. So essentially meaning that this is already happening, which is logical when you turn up with two different Parkinson's diseases, body first versus brain first, you would expect that also these groups have differences before they are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease because there are reasons why one gets it from the gut and the other one gets it from the brain. So looking at the microbiome in connection with all these different um, prodromal and risk factors that we know, we were interested whether, we, whether there is any hint towards a, a subgrouping of these prodromal patients or these prodromal subjects already, basically. So if there are already groups that we can uh, identify before they're diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And this was really only an initial study, but, but in the, in, at the end, basically what we found supports this idea because we, since the microbiome was actually not really connected to the overall risk of getting Parkinson's disease. So that, there was not really a connection there, but there was a connection uh, to certain prodromal and risk markers, but not to others. Basically suggesting that actually these subtypes may be existing already in the prodromal uh, phase of the disease and that the microbiome may differentially contribute to different subtypes. And, and so I think this, uh, this is suggested that we're continuing this work. So we will uh, continue uh, doing analysis of the microbiota in these brain first and body first patients and, and getting more information also about these, uh, the subject from this large cohort in trying to cluster, cluster the, the, the subjects in these cohorts based on multiomics uh, profiles.